Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Light on the Rock. This is Philip Shields, and I've had some issues the last little few weeks or months, and so I'm hoping this is a decent recording for you. Um, I'm back to recording again for the Light on the Rock. I do have a sermon there about a series of sermons about the Sabbath, and I'll be talking about more on the Sabbath soon. Today, though, I'm talking about something that we all sooner or later really have to deal with. All of us have to sooner or later deal with it. Do you often find yourself saying, I'm worried about, or, or I'm, I'm afraid that, or variants of that? What do you fear? Or do you claim to have no worries, no fears? In Jamaica, they have this wonderful saying, no problem, man. But I wonder if they're really as laid back as all that. Maybe they are. And maybe that's a lesson for all of us, that we can learn the same thing. I remember in the Philippines, growing up as a child there, son of a missionary, I'm going to talk fast because I've got a lot of notes, so <laughs> turn your hearing speed up a little bit. I, I was a, a child in the Philippines. My father, uh, Clyde, Clyde Shields, uh, was a missionary in San Fernando, La Union, in the, the, uh, on the big island of Luzon. And um, you Filipinos who come to the site will appreciate the story. Uh, maybe all of you will. So I grew up in San Fernando, La Union. I spoke Ilocano fluently as a boy. And my father had a, had a mission there, and so he'd bring these missionaries over, men and women, preachers alike, who would come and stay a few weeks with us and preach and all that. And we had to go to my father's church. One lady preacher was up there preaching about overcoming fear, that we have nothing to fear. She had her Bible in her hand. She was pacing back and forth and proclaiming how we should all look to God all the time. Nothing at all should make us afraid. Nothing at all, she's saying, and she's hitting her Bible. Nothing at all. And just then, in my mind's eye, I could imagine God above winking at an angel so that just then one of the very common house lizards that run back and forth on the ceilings and never, ever are a problem. They eat bugs and around the lights and on the ceiling. Fell, the only one I've ever seen in my life, fell off the ceiling right smack onto her Bible, just as she was saying, we have nothing to fear, absolutely nothing to fear. And then as that beautiful lizard smacked right on her Bible, she throws her Bible up in the air. Ah, she's screaming. Anyway, I've never, ever seen one of those house lizards ever fall, ever. But this one fell right on her Bible as she was saying, we have nothing to fear. And I just cannot help but think that our Heavenly Father, who is such a wonderful being, uh, just said, okay, let's test this out. <laughs> as she was speaking, waxing eloquent, right there in front of a hundred people or so, screaming, uh, running off the stage, pitching the Bible up in the air. <laughs> we all still laugh about it. Anyway, so I'm not going to preach a sermon that says we have, you never ever have to go through fear, ever, ever, ever. Uh, I'm going to talk about dealing with the fears that, that do happen to us. If you breathe air and, and uh, bleed red blood, uh, if you're a normal human being, with or without the Holy Spirit, at times you will slip into fear. I do too. We call, call it worry. Call it apprehension. Call it the things that keep us awake at night or keep you from being able to fall asleep. What are those thoughts? What are those fears? What are those concerns? Call it outright terror. I'm telling you, if you live in Raqqa right now, in, in, in Iraq or, or Syria, uh, Iraq, Syria, I guess it is, or if you lived um, in... Uh, these cities where Christians, people who say they are Christians and believers in the Christ, are being crucified, call it outright terror. What do you do about it? How are you handling those things? How, are, how do you gain peace of mind as you watch the news? How do you gain victory over these? These are normal fears that anybody can have. So, however fear, I, I, yeah, I've heard years ago, fear des described as uh, false evidence appearing real. It's false evidence because uh, it's not taking our great God into effect, into account. When the Israelites saw the Egyptians behind them and the Red Sea in front of them, that was evidence, but it's false evidence because it wasn't complete evidence that our great God in heaven was able to open up the Red Sea and let them through and destroy all those Egyptians. But I slip into it too. It's so easy to read the stories and then and then still fall back. And that's part of the answer is, is read those stories because fear comes by hearing of the word. And so I'm, I'm fear, not fear, faith, faith. Sometimes you have to translate for me if I'm in a hurry. <laughs> faith comes by hearing of the word. And that's in Romans chapter 10. I believe it's chapter 10. It just came to me as I'm speaking now. 
But even the great apostle Paul fell sometimes into inward fears at times. But in those fears, he knew what to do. We'll share a lot of that today. He says in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 5 and 6, 2 Corinthians 7, Indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts. Inside were fears. Inside were fears. So even the strongest of us can fall into fear. David did. Peter did. Paul did. We all do. Remember Elijah, that great man of faith, the great prophet who called down fire from heaven? The story is in 1 Kings 18 and 19, what I'm referring to here. In chapter 18, he calls down fire from heaven, kills hundreds of the false priests after that all happened. And then, and then he gets a note from the queen that you're going to be a dead man when I get my hands on you, Elijah, you're going to be a dead man. And he ran like a rabbit in fear and severe depression. Ran like a rabbit down to Mount Sinai. But that's very, very normal. Yeah, because he was human. So, But my point is we all can fall into it. If you're not facing any fears right now, I hope you'll still hear the sermon and come back to it. You will face some many fears in the years ahead. Paul was very clear in 2 Timothy 3, 1 that in the times ahead, in the last days, he said, perilous times, perilous times will come. We're told that there's coming a great tribulation, a great time of trouble. Yeshua described it as being so bad that the earth has never seen anything that bad. I know, I know, many, many people believe we're going to be taken to a place of safety or even raptured. Um, and yet, if you read Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 and other places, it is clear that somebody who's being called saints by, by, by Scripture, holy ones, people of God, children of God, are the target of genocide. So maybe many will be taken to a place of safety or something out, but somehow thousands and thousands and thousands. Let's read it in Daniel 7 verse 24. Daniel 7, verse 24 and 25. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. Daniel 7, 25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. Shall persecute. A Hebrew word actually means wear out, like King James has it. Wear out the saints. He's going to wear us out. I mean, you know, you can take trouble here and trouble there, but when it comes on and on and on, like a wave after wave after wave after wave that goes on for three and a half years, that can wear you out. This man shall intend, or this person shall intend to um, change times and law, and the saints shall be given, the saints, the holy ones, which shall be given into his hand for a time times and half a time. That's three and a half years. But if that's not enough, then we read the scriptures. I'll list in Revelation in, uh, where in the fifth seal the martyrs are depicted as asking, how long, O Lord? How long before our blood is avenged? In Revelation 6, verses 9 to 10. Revelation 6, verses 9 to 10. And Revelation 13, verse 7. You can read through verse 10 on your own. It says, it was granted to him, Revelation 13, 7, this beast power, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So the notion that we'll all be up in heaven somehow watching all this going down, somebody's here on earth who's being overcome. Someone's down here on earth who's being worn out. Someone's here on earth who's being persecuted mightily and being killed to the point where uh, we're told that there's a cry in heaven, when will our blood be avenged? This false church depicted as a drunken whore in Revelation 17.6 is seen in Revelation 17.6 as drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Yeshua, of Jesus. So don't think that all the saints are miraculously somehow spared all of this. And yet having said that, I think we are going to see many, many miracles of God's intervention. Psalm 91 is always a good one to read in time of terror. Though a thousand, ten thousand can fall on your right and a thousand fall on your other side, Psalm 91, 7, you won't let fear overcome you because we've learned to make Yehovah 
our refuge. Our God will toughen us up with other fears first, such as being told you have cancer. I, what I'm trying to say is I think we're being toughened up, you guys. We're being, we're being prepared for the real testing that's coming ahead. If you want to be on a, if you want to be a star player of the football team or go to the Olympics, you've got to be toughened up. You've got to go through some pain. You've got to go through some stresses. And I, I really don't think that we really understand that enough. So our God is putting us through fears, such as being told you have cancer, or facing a beloved grandchild, badly hurt in the hospital, or you're being racked with severe pain that just won't go away. Just a few days of severe pain is bad enough for me. I, I've had several months and months of, of, of pains here, here and there, but nothing like my brother's going through and others. But still, I couldn't stand it. Or the fear of losing your job, or being told you've lost your job, or your home. So that's what we're talking about, fear, how to handle it. What are your fears? What are your fears? Are you afraid you're going to lose your job? Are you afraid you have a serious illness? Are you afraid you're going to get kicked out of your believer? Are you afraid of disasters? You can't afford to remedy? Are you terrified by the announcement that a tornado's on the way, uh, heading your way, or hurricane? Those are scary. Are you afraid you won't make it into the kingdom, or that you aren't making it? That's a whole different topic. We, no need to fear that. Are you afraid of that storm on the way? Like I said, are you afraid you're going to lose your kids? Are you afraid the stock market's going to crash? You're going to lose everything you've saved up. Are you afraid God's going to let you go through some very painful trials? And yes, he can. What are you afraid of? So listen to the sermon, okay? And one thing we need to face up to right now, this is what I call the if-not factor. We all know we should learn not to be afraid since we have a great God, a great Father watching over us. I'll say much more about that as we go along. That's all true. But here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. God quite often makes us go through things that terrify us. This woman who hated, not hated, but was terrified of simple house lizards similar to the ones we have here in Florida, except these in Florida stay more on the ground and the walls. The ones in the Philippines love the ceilings. But he doesn't spare us going through every pain and scary moment of life. And sometimes those scary moments end up with us dying or our loved ones dying. Billions and billions, in fact, of people have died ahead of us, right? And so will you and so will I. And it won't always be what we all dream of, that I'll be happy and strong, and one night when I'm 95 years old, I'll uh, go to bed and uh, just die in my sleep peacefully. That happens to a few people. That happens to a few. But we have to accept that our Maker, that from our Maker, as part of this discussion, that He allows some horrible things for His wisdom, for His purposes. For every Daniel who's saved from the lions, there were thousands of others who were not, but were torn apart in the Roman Colosseum. And for that matter, even those who were delivered often still had to face painful, painful events. What I'm trying to say is this, all the faith in the world will not stop you from having to face, to use your faith, and from having to use your faith and face some terrifying times. Think of all the scary events King David and Paul and the early apostles and Christians all had to face. Let's read the if not factor. In Daniel 3, we have the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three friends of Daniel. Daniel apparently wasn't in town when this happened, or there would have been four of them. <clears throat> Daniel 3, 8 to 18. I'll summarize it, but please, uh, I'll put the whole thing in the notes here, but uh, Nebuchadnezzar had, re had raised up this, this big, large golden statue. And um, he basically says to, to everybody, when, 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 when the band 
strikes up when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, and the symphony, and all kinds. All of you better bow down to this idol I put up, or else you're going to be burned alive in a fiery furnace. Well, word came to Nebuchadnezzar that these three Jewish government people, government people, they were top people in the government, but they were Jews. And these three friends of Daniel weren't bowing down. They won't bow down. They have no regard for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. There, he's being told in Daniel 3, verses 8 to 12. And so verse 13, Daniel 3, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's angry as can be, he commands them to be brought to him, and he tells them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, verse 14, Daniel 3, that you won't serve my gods or worship the gold image I've set up. Now I'm going to give you another, another chance, he says. I'm going to put the, I'm going to put the, uh, I'm going to start the music again, and, and, and you better, you better bow down, or else with what God out there can save you from the fire that I'm going to have you thrown into? If you don't worship, you'll be cast immediately. At the end of verse 15, Daniel 3.15, into the midst of this burning fiery furnace. And then here's the if not factor. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we, have no, we don't even have to think about this. We have no need to answer you. Our mind's made up. So verse 17, if that's the case, our God, whom our God, start talking not just about God or Elohim, talk about our God, my God, make a personal possession there like they did. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Verse 18 is the if not factor, but if not. So you see, a true sermon about fear is not going to say that you'll never have to go through the, the thing that's so scary, that God will always deliver you from it. No, he won't. No, he won't. And thousands and thousands and thousands of believers in Yeshua and Almighty God have been burned at the stake, beheaded, tortured, killed, and have died from painful cancers, all kinds of things, even though they were believers. And thousands and thousands of thousands and millions maybe of others have been healed. I've been healed from time to time of very, very serious things. And yet I could still die like Elisha did. He died of an illness that he wasn't healed from, and yet he himself healed so many. Paul himself, who healed so many and had so many powerful prayers, ends up being beheaded, the Apostle Paul. So faith is not just about believing everything's going to work out great all the time right here and now, but being okay with God when it doesn't, when he allows us to go through the end with pain and trial and suffering. We cannot let ourselves be disappointed with God when he fails us, when he fails to heal, when he lets someone die, when he lets your house be hit by lightning, like ours was twice in the last few years. And, the, you know, the first time that happened, I frankly had a question. Why? Why my house? You're supposed to be my protector. I gave a sermon on when God disappoints. You might want to write that down and look it up. In, when God disappoints. And I had to repent deeply of my disappointment because our life is to learn to trust, 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 trust our God, our Abba, our Father, our beloved Yeshua, no matter what we're facing. Even if he lets us go through losing a job, losing our house, this is just getting us ready for the the hard stuff that's coming ahead of us. You heard me right. So can you believe in God, whether or not he will deliver you from your fears or not? There are times he delivers, there are times, if we're honest with ourselves and with scripture and history, that God does allow his people to go through some terrible times. Look, John the Baptist, considered the greatest man, according to Yeshua, 
He was beheaded. He wasn't spared. The very Son of God, not spared, but tortured, beaten, humiliated, crucified. Apparently, just about all the apostles, except maybe John, had violent deaths. Hebrews 11 chronicles how people lost their homes, lived in caves, sawn asunder. But too many of us don't want the uncomfortable subjects like this for sermons. And yet this could become one of the most important sermons that can impact your life if you hear how we're supposed to face our fears every day and live through horrific events that are coming. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 22 to 29. Just write it down maybe. I don't know if I'll read the whole thing, but the Apostle Paul, uh, certainly a man of God, close to God. I mean, our Father in Heaven, in Second Corinthians 11, he says he was in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure. You couldn't even count the number of lashings I got, especially from the Romans. It didn't bother counting them because they weren't counting. The Jews stopped at least at 39. In prisons more frequently, in deaths often, from the Jews, five times I received the 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods, you know, broken ribs, broken shoulder, collarbones, concussions. Three times beaten with rods. Once I was stoned and, I'll add, left for dead. I think that was in Lystra or Iconium, one of those places. Three times I was shipwrecked. Three times. So I've been hit by lightning. Our house has been, you know, twice so we moved to a different house <laughs> not because of that but uh, I, I hope but anyway uh, you, you think okay I've been shipwrecked once but but then again and then again three times a night and in a day I was in the deep journeys often perils of waters perils of robbers and he goes on to talk about them all that's what he went through do you think you and I are going to be spared anything less than that the Navy SEALs, we're being trained for far more than Navy SEALs. They are pushed almost to the, light, to the point of life and death. In fact, some, I think three or four Navy SEALs in training have, been, have died in training. In the end, though, they come out as the best fighting force in the world. They come out prepared to face the toughest possible conditions. My brother and sister, you're being called to be a part of a team far stronger, far more important than any Navy SEAL Team 6 you could ever imagine. That means, yes, you are going to be pushed, and I am going to be pushed to the limit. This is not a feel-good sermon about how God works everything out beautifully. Sometimes the working out beautifully is in the resurrection. When Paul was beheaded, where, where was the working out beautifully except in the resurrection? When John the Baptist was beheaded, and the thousands and thousands and thousands who will be in the years ahead. So your God is preparing you for eternity. If I was your coach preparing you for the Olympics, hey, you'd be up at 4.30 or 5 in the morning, pushing you to the limit, to when you think you can't do any more, and I say five more swim laps. And do you think you'll be spared the rigors of preparing you for eternity, to be a kingdom of God ruler and, and, and priest in the kingdom of God for eternity? without being pushed and pushed and pushed. You'll never be pushed beyond what you're able, but what you're able will be far stronger than you think you're able when, when you begin it. I know, you know, I know. Things that we've been through and mine are nothing compared to other people. My sister just died after a long struggle, 14 years. I lost one of our children. I've had several surgeries and pains. I've been told I've had cancer various times. I was told I probably had a brain tumor. And all these various things that come up, and then God heals us or intervenes, and then you, but sometimes he may not, the if not factor. Paul tells us in Acts 14, 22, Acts 14, 22, it is through much tribulation, a lot of trouble, that we enter the kingdom of God. It's not a broad, narrow way, is it? It's a narrow, difficult way. And the whole point of all of this is our Father, our beloved 
His Majesty the King, wants to know, needs to know, that we will trust, will trust, will trust, will trust Him, no matter what. So how do we get there? I've got seven points I'd like to just go over quickly. You know, first of all, understand having fear is normal. We, we all have to deal with it. But I think one of the biggest points in dealing with fear is we have to really know that our beloved Yeshua is right there. He's in us. And we're in Him. He's not just there watching. He's in us. And we're in Him. Our Father is in us, according to 1 John 4, around verse 15. God the Father is in us, and we're in Him through Christ. When my children were little and they would get scared, if they saw me around them, they would immediately be fine. I reminded them I'd be for them. I know I'd take a bullet without hesitation for any of my children or grandchildren if I could, if I needed to. When my children were young, if, if I was with them, they're all fine. They felt safe. Your Savior says, don't worry. Go back and read Matthew 5 and Matthew 6. Four times at the end of Matthew 6, he says, don't worry. It's one of his commands. So when we're worrying, we're basically saying, I wonder if my Father, if my God is up to this task. Oh, this is so scary. And so many times we find our God saying to various ones, Fear not, don't be afraid. I'm your full body shield, like he said to Abraham in Genesis 15.1. I am your shield. The Hebrew there is full body shield. Don't worry, don't, don't be afraid, Abraham. I know you've killed these kings and you, you think they're going to come back and get, get you. Don't worry about it. Hey, I'm here, I'm watching over you. Shalom, have peace. But we fear. You see, fear immobilizes at times. Fear is not always a bad thing. Fear sometimes makes us get our hands off the stove or run if, in times of trouble, if we can. Even Yeshua got out of times when they were trying to, uh, one time in Nazareth, they were going to throw him over the cliff, and he, he, he got away and got away from them. He didn't just sit there and say, I don't have to be afraid of all of you. He did what he could do. Unconquered fear begets more fear. So, but but fear fear can be good if if it, if it teaches us to get out of dangerous situation. But fear also makes us sin and try to handle things ourselves outside of God's way. Fear spreads those all around us, and so that's why one of God's rules was: if you go into war and someone's afraid, let them go home. We don't need them. We don't want them. We don't want them in the group. Even Gideon was told that. Let's turn to Matthew 7, verses 7 to 12. Matthew 7, verses 7 to 12. If we really come to know our God as a loving Abba, a daddy, and our daddy happens to be El Shaddai, the almighty God, the most powerful and loving being out there in the whole universe, happens to be my dad happens to be my dad and he'll only let me go through what he thinks I should go through for my good I've got to trust him trust him trust him Matthew 7 7 to 12 ask and it shall be given to you seek you'll find it knock hey the door will open everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened he says you guys you know what man is there among you if, if your son asks for a piece of bread you give him a stone. If he asks for a fish, you give him a serpent. Come on, you guys who aren't even good people, you're evil. If you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven give good things to those who ask Him? In fact, in James it says, every good and perfect gift is from a Father above. Ultimately, the breath we, the air we breathe. Everything. At the end of Matthew 6, verses 25 to 33, Messiah says over and over, don't worry, at least four times, I think. Don't worry about your life. Don't worry about clothing. Don't worry about anything. God takes care of the birds and the flowers of the field. How much more is he going to take care of you? Don't worry. That's what pagan and unsaved Gentiles do. 
So if you look for it, you'll hear the gentleness of God many, many times. Even when he was furious with Israel for the gold calf incident, when Moses went up the second time, in Exodus 34, verses 5 to 7, Exodus 34, verses 5 to 7, when Moses went up to get the second set of Ten Commandments, because Moses was furious as well, and he broke all ten of the commandments. <laughs> he threw the two tablets down, broke them, had to go back up and get another one. And one thing that our Abba said, our Yeshua said, our Creator said, Yehovah, Yehovah Elohim, Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. You see, you get the idea. That's the kind of that's the kind of picture I want you to have of the one you worship. Elsewhere, he tells us everything that happens to us is known by God before it happens. Everything. Not a single hair falls off our head without him knowing it. Not a single sparrow falls to the ground without him knowing it. And the if but question is what scares us. You know, if not question, I mean, you know, that that's what scares us. That sometimes, yeah, the sparrow dies, to the, falls to the ground. But at least he's aware of it. So, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we have to be like the prodigal son in the prodigal son experience. And what was that? The son had just squandered his family inheritance on booze, drunken parties, whores, wasteful living, prostitutes, until he was broke. But when he remembered his father's goodness, he says, I remember my, even the servants have enough bread. When he remembered the father's goodness, goodness. It's the goodness of God that drives us to repentance, Romans 2, 4 says. It's the goodness of God that makes us want to come home, like this prodigal son. He brought shame on the family name. And yet, since the prodigal's father represents God in the story, and his relationship with us, this is talking to us. And it's in Luke 15, the, the story of the prodigal son among other stories. Luke 15, one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible. And since the prodigal son's father represents God, this was the time when God ran. When God pulled up, girded up his loins and ran. And the, and the Greek word there, sprinted. Ran where? Ran to his returning son to rejoice with him to celebrate with him, to restore him as a full son, even after all those horrible things he'd done. It's got to be one of my favorite stories. Because you see, that's my story. And I've come home. And my God ran to welcome me home. And he runs to you. And he held me in his arms. He pressed my head against his chest and said, Welcome home, son. I forgive. I want to celebrate now with you because all's well. There's a song out there called When God Ran. You ought to hear it. It's about this very story. When God Ran. So see your God as your daddy who loves you. The fretting and the fearing will subside. And we've got to all quit saying our problems are bigger than our Father and our beloved Yeshua's abilities to take care of things. Because when we fear, when we fret, when we worry, we are sinning. We are making those things bigger than Almighty God. That's a sin. So do not worry partly by remembering who your Abba, your daddy is. When God ran. So number one was to come to know God as a kind and loving God and Father. Number two, now face what you fear and look to him all the time that's happening and not just in the fearful times, but learn to do it all the time. Isolate your fears, take them to Christ, our fathers, leave them there. 
So number one, know who your father is, that he's loving and kind and all-powerful. Number two, now use that loving, kind, all-powerful father and give him your problems. You know, my dog, Zoe, a wonderful, beautiful English Springer Spaniel, just a beautiful dog, for so, so affectionate, but very timid. <laughs> I don't want her to hear it. <laughs> She's afraid of the vacuum cleaner. She's afraid of any noises all of a sudden. My wife thought it would be good to have a timid dog because she thought it would be less rambunctious than the typical English Springers. Well, we got the rambunctious side and, and the timid side. Anyway, I was pulling out the vacuum cleaner. She's terrified of it. Maybe it hurts her ears or something, but it wasn't on. And I felt it was an unreasonable fear. And so I, I was in the hallway, and I lovingly called her over to me I said, look, I'm bigger than this vacuum cleaner, Zoe. She speaks English, you see. She's an English speaker spaniel, so she speaks English. I said, come here. Come here. I speak English to her, you see. Come over here. And uh, she kind of put her tail down, and I said, come, come on. Poppy loves you. And so I gave her a big hug about a foot away from the vacuum. Then I moved her a little closer, and I kept saying in a gentle tone, it's okay. And she pressed hard to me, away from the vacuum. <laughs> Finally, tail wagging, she was starting to sniff it. And okay, oh, okay. Because I was saying, it's okay, it's okay, I'm with you. I think many times we're like Zoe. And the thing that terrifies us, Almighty God is saying, a few Egyptian soldiers behind you? Or news of cancer, I can heal your body right now. And he's healed me of cancer in the past instantly. I've seen him heal people with stroke instantly. Instantly. And other times he has not. And God was so gentle with Gideon. God did the Zoe thing with the vacuum cleaner with Gideon. And I'll read that later. Um, Psalm 34.4 I sought Jehovah, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. That's where I go when I was afraid. Mark 4, the story, Mark 4, verses 35 to 41, the great story of they're all tired and they're having to cross the Sea of Galilee. It's a big lake out there. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat. Mark 4, verse 37, I'm reading. And the waves beat into the boat, so it was already filling. It was filling up with water. Yeshua was sound asleep in the boat, in the stern, asleep on a pillow. They woke him up. Teacher, teacher, don't you care? We're gonna, we're gonna perish. <laughs> You're talking to the one who created wind. You're talking to the one who created water. We're gonna perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, "Peace, be still. Shalom." Knock it off. The wind. This is me, me talking here. The wind bowed down to him. He said, sorry, master. Became like a sheet of glass. Great calm, it says. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? Why are you... Waves coming into the boat? How is it you have no faith? They feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, you know, Yeshua said that you and I should be able to do greater things than he did. Greater things if we had but a faith of a mustard seed. And so last October 2016, Hurricane Matthew, Matthew means the grace of God, but Hurricane Matthew, which did terrible damage in Jamaica and Haiti as it came up, and then the eastern coast, just off the coast of Florida. I'm telling you, it, it, it was barely moving. And we lived about 50 miles from the coast, and yet this was a hurricane, what was it, three or four? I think it was a four at the point I'm talking about with winds up to 135 miles an hour. And it wasn't moving. It was sitting there. Not like other hurricanes that went through quickly. This one was sitting there. And so we were being told a couple of days before that when it got parallel to our house, 
those bands of winds might be 110, 120 by the time it's 50 miles away, but still 110, 120, 130 miles an hour, 95 to 100 miles an hour, sustained for 14 to 16 hours. Well, we prayed about it. We didn't really worry. We moved further inland to my daughter's house, and so we're now 100 miles away from the coastline ourselves, but our house that we just put a brand new roof on and paid $17,000 for was going to be hit, we were told. Okay, anyway, what happened is the night that it finally got up as far as our house along the coast, the band of wind, anyway, we heard this, let me, I'm, I'm, let me tell you, we heard this crying in the house at my daughter's house, and it was a little Ollie, he was two years old. And um, so we got up, and he needed changing or something. So my wife did that, and I held him a while, and, and then I started thinking, I'm going to check the uh, my smartphone and see where this hurricane is. I have perfect faith that it's, it's all subsided by now. And so I look it up, and my mouth drops. They, they're saying it's it's like it's like an hour away from hitting our home because it's moving very slowly, but the band of winds is coming, and it's going to be 95 to 120 miles an hour for 14 hours sustained, not moving, not gusts, sustained winds. Now, I remembered what Yeshua told us. I'm standing there by the bed, in my bedroom by myself. I said, Hurricane Matthew, in Yeshua's name, I have no power, but I have all the power of the universe. In Yeshua's mighty name, I command you in his name. You go bounce back out to sea at least 50 miles. You get out of here. You move out of here right now. In Yeshua's mighty name, I order it. I command it. And then I said in my prayer, I said, Father in heaven, there are so many people who live in trailer homes in, in Florida, and they're going to be killed if this thing, it's going to be horrible. In fact, we were told the night before that nobody was to be on the on the roads the next day in, in Orange County where we lived because they expected so many power lines, so many trees down, so many problems that they didn't want anybody endangering their lives or others. And, and, and they said everybody else has to stay home. No one's allowed to get out. Because that's what they were expecting, you see. And then just as I finished my prayer, my wife came in and said, what's going on? I said, I told her what happened. She says, well, you prayed about it? I said, yes. Let's go to bed. There's nothing more we can do. And God can certainly take care of that. And she went to sleep, and she fell asleep very quickly. <laughs> my wonderful wife. Next morning when we woke up, you know what we found out? Hurricane Matthew had bounced out to sea quickly and suddenly at the time I had made that prayer. And I'll promise you, there were probably, probably hundreds of other people who were praying as well. So I'm not taking credit for it. Giving all the credit to our great almighty God in heaven and Yeshua who controls the winds and the waves. All the credit. And I thank all those who also prayed with me. I'm sure because the next day we saw signs out front of homes in Florida. Thank you, God, for sparing us. Thank you. I wonder if they would have signs like that in New York City. I don't know. I hope so. But remember that when we have fears and worries, the cares of this world will make you unfruitful. It says in the par parable of the sower, this one in Mark 4, verses 18 and 19, the cares of this world will choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Don't let that happen to you. Psalm 55, verse 22, cast your burden, throw it out there. Sometimes what I've done is I've written down my fears on a piece of paper, in big black felt ink on a big notepad of paper. And, and I've done this in the past. I've written down my two or three biggest things I'm afraid of personal things and then I cast it away from me throw it in a fire or shred it when I'm done I don't even want other people reading what I was afraid of that's what you got to do but I find it helpful to me if I literally can see my fear and see my hand crumpling it up and then pulling it out putting it in a shredder saying so much for you fears get out of here that's what Peter says First Peter 5 7 Cast all your cares on God, for he cares for you. So that's points one and two right there. Psalm 27, the Yehovah. Psalm 27, read the first five verses or so. Yehovah is my light. He's my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
And yet we know that even David feared other people. Jehovah is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came up to me to eat my flesh, he says, and this and that happened, he says, you know what? Verse 5, in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the time of trouble, tribulation, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Verse 14, wait on Jehovah, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on Jehovah. I say Jehovah instead of the Lord, because that, that's what it is. There's no the there. Jehovah is his name. It means ageless, ageless, timeless, eternal. This one, in Psalm 55, verse 1 to 7, especially verses 4 and 5, David admits to having fear. Uh, give ear to my prayer, O God. Psalm 55, God, would you please listen, please. And don't hide yourself from my supplication. Attend to me, hear me. You're, why are you not hearing me? Saying, I'm restless in my complaint. I moan noisily because of the voice of the enemy and so on. Verse 4, my heart is severely pained within me. I'm getting chest pains from the things I fear. David says in Psalm 55, verse 4, the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling. I'm trembling in fear. I'm peeing my pants. Oh, that's not in scripture, but I think that's what he's kind of saying. Horror has overcome me, overwhelmed me. And verse 6, oh, that I wish I had wings. Wings is like a dove. That I could just fly away and be at rest, be in peace. Indeed, I'd wander off and I'd remain in the wilderness. So, so verse, Psalm 55, the first seven verses, he admits to being in terrible fear. Verse 16 and 17, As for me, I'll call on God. Jehovah shall save me. Evening, morning, and noon I will pray and cry aloud. So that's saying in context that when he was scared to death is when he would pray three times a day. But the actual fact is it would be good for us to learn to pray many, many times. Psalm 56, the next psalm, David. Whenever I am afraid, Psalm 56, verse 3 and 4. Psalm 56, verse 3 and 4. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I put my trust. I will not fear. I won't let fear come into my head. Now, so, verse 3, whenever I'm afraid... Okay, I have the fear. The second part of the verse, I'm going to put that fear in you. In God, I'll put my trust. And so the result is, I will not fear. Verse 4. Elisha. Uh, Elisha. Uh, uh, an enemy army had come to capture him and his servant. And they were inside a city. And the servant looks outside the walls and says, Whoa! Have you seen the thousands and thousands of horsemen and chariots and soldiers here come to get us? We don't stand a chance. So in 2 Kings 6, verses 16 to 18, Elisha, he answers the servant and says, Don't fear. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. That is such a good verse to remember if a big gang of thugs someday in the future is coming down to you and you see them coming and they're, they're not meaning well. Don't fear. Those who are with me are more than those who are with them. Elisha prayed, Okay, Yehovah, I pray open his eyes that he may see. And Yehovah opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire of fire all around Elisha. You see what they did? You could be afraid, but then you need to know where to look. When Daniel saw that Goliath, that giant problem they had, insulting the living God, he says, what gives this uncircumcised idiot out there a right to do that? And we sit here and let him do it? And he focused on God, not on the armor. He focused on Jehovah, not on the armor. He had no fear of Goliath. He ran to meet him. In fact, he, he took five stones with him, I think, because Goliath, if you read other places, had four giant problems, problem brothers. 
And I think David was saying, okay, Goliath, if your brothers come to help you, I'll take them on too, because God is with me. They who are with me are greater than they who are with you. What's the Goliath, the big problem in your life? Take it to Almighty God. Take it to Yehovah. Destroy those fearful thoughts. A couple of my favorite verses. Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. If you're not at peace about anything, you've taken your mind off of him. You've taken your eyes off of him. Trust in Yehovah forever, for in Yah Yehovah, that's what it is in the Hebrew, Yah is a shortened form of Yehovah, like saying Dad instead of Daddy, or Phil instead of Philip. So, um, anyway, trust in Yehovah forever, for in Yah Yehovah is everlasting strength. Isaiah 26, verse 3 and 4, I just read. Now, Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 14, God had just chastised Judah very, very strongly and sent them into captivity. And you might think like, well, that's it now. I'm going, I'm, I've, lost, I've lost my Yehovah. I've lost my Abba. I've lost my Savior. No, no. Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 13 says, For I know the thoughts, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says Yehovah, thoughts of peace, Thoughts of shalom, and not of evil, to give you a future. Boy, what a future. Eternal life for us, and hope. And then you will call upon me and, and, and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me, and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. So that's our focus. Go back and read Psalm 91 now. Now, point number three. Okay, number one, come to know your father. He's all powerful. He loves you dearly. He's gonna he's gonna let you go through only what he knows is best. Point number two, then focus on him and the trial and the problem. Focus number three is monitor, direct all your thoughts. It's kind of a variant of point number two. Put a checkpoint up there. When you come into our subdivision, there's a gate there with a guy with a and there's a guard. Uh, in a subdivision, it's a gated community with a guard, with a gun, and you have to come and show your ID and who you are and what your business is. And then the gate goes up. So our mind is kind of like that. There should be a security gate there. Um, we're told in Second Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5, Second Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5, that though we walk in the flesh, we don't make war just in the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And let's bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Wow! Every thought into obedience of Christ. And so when you're faced with a thought that, that is not right, you are supposed to rebuke it, cast down strongholds. Our Savior himself, Yeshua, when he was telling his disciples that I am going to die, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be killed. And as he did that, that story is in Matthew 16, verses 21 to 23. Okay, as he did that, uh, Peter takes him aside and says, no, 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 that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen to you at all. And so, what did Yeshua say? Do you remember the story? He looked at Peter in Matthew 16, verses 21 to 23, and said, Get behind me, Satan, Satan, adversary. He looks at Peter right in the eye, but he knows he's not really just talking to Peter, but a thought that Peter let come into his mind without the checkpoint, without bringing it to submission and obedience to Christ. And he said, Get behind me, Satan, for you know not the thoughts of God, just the thoughts of men. Are you getting it? Do we do that? That's what we're supposed to do. 
And then uh, uh, Proverbs 23, verse 7 says, We are, we become what we think about. As a man thinks, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. So don't speak out your fears. Watch those. Don't speak them out. Um, un unless you're speaking it out to God. That's it. If you dwell on fear, something out there will bring your thoughts about to fruition many times. That's exactly what Job said in Job 3, verse 25. Job 3, verse 25. You know, in Job 1, we hear that he was out there sacrificing all the time because I'm afraid my kids are doing something wrong and then God's going to get angry and he's going to have bad things happen and we're going to lose my kids. So I'll sacrifice for them. And then he lost them all because of what Satan had done and God allowed Satan to do it. In Job 3, 25, the one thing I greatly feared has come upon me. Monitor those thoughts. Don't let fearful thoughts stay in there. Monitor those thoughts. Throw them out. What I dreaded has happened to me. Job 3, 25. So we are what we think about, and our fears can come upon us. So what? So now we've got to cast out those fears. It's our thoughts that cause us to sin. James 1, 12 to 15 says, Hey, don't ever think you're being tempted by God. God won't tempt you. You're tempted. James 1, 14 now. Each one has been tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires. And that starts with our thinking. And enticed. James 1, verse 15. And then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full growth, grown, brings forth death. So that's why God wiped out the uh, the first uh, the first world, Noah's time, uh, because the thoughts of their hearts were on evil continually. Genesis six five. Every intent of the thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. You know, so he knew that uh, you think bad things, you're going to have bad things happen. Guy go garbage in, garbage out. Computer uh, software people know that. Garbage in, garbage out. Stop the garbage going in. Stop watching things that make you afraid. Stop watching things that... Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I've never watched it. I never would. Okay, that's my point. Why, why watch movies like that, Friday the 13th, and movies like that, or, or about all these movies that are on there, and I've never watched a single one. I've seen portions of them, like three or four minutes. What on earth are all these zombie movies... And after about two or three minutes, no, the, the, the security gate comes up. No, these are not in submission to Christ. I'm not putting fearful thoughts. I'm not putting sexual thoughts. I'm not putting lustful thoughts. I'm not putting vengeful thoughts. I'm not putting uh, violent movie thoughts into my head. I've had to turn the TV off many times. I'm a guy. I like, I like, I like, I like action, we call it. So, you know, when they, nowadays uh, they show the spear and the sword going in and the blood... Uh, no, we don't need that, folks. We don't need that. You can always figure out what you're thinking about. Now, get this point. You can always figure out what you're thinking about simply by your moods and emotions. If you're angry and upset, worried, depressed, and fearful, you can't sleep, you're letting stinking thinking get into your head. A man named Zig Ziglar used to talk about stinking thinking. And it's so true. So I preach to myself too. I've been there lots of times, allowing fears, rejection, de dejection, depression, and other sinful thoughts to be my thoughts. And that's wrong. But when you put the security gate up to your mind and refuse those thoughts by dwelling on God's Word, faith comes by hearing the Word. So... What I do now when I drive, I don't listen to talk radio. I find my blood pressure goes up. I don't listen to talk radio anymore. I certainly don't listen to rap. I don't even listen to country music if it's all negative stuff. So much of country music is negative stuff. Oh, I heard one the other day, The Love in Father's Hand. That was a beautiful song. But, if the, but, but mostly what I do now is I put in a CD of the Bible. I did the, the CD of Romans the other day. And I'll go back and I'll hear that whole book three times till I can practically say it with the CD. Then I know that those thoughts are in my head. Then I'll go to one of the, uh, the maybe the Psalms, or maybe I'll go to uh, Colossians or Ephesians. And now you're getting good thoughts. And you're having thoughts that will help you. So when Yeshua was about to be crucified, 
he says to them on this awful night, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. But not like the world gives. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. That's a command. Don't let it trouble you. Don't let yourself get afraid. Rebuke those thoughts like Yeshua did. And don't let thoughts that question God. It's another point on this thought control. The why Lord question. I've learned to stop that. I don't need to know why. I don't need to know when. I don't need to know how he's going to resolve these things. All I need to know is who. Who am I walking with? Who is my father? I don't need to know how, when, or how, or, or, or what, or, or why. I just need to know who. You start having thoughts about why, God, why did you let my child die? And I did that. Boy, was I depressed for a long, long, long time. I couldn't even hold the little boy for two years. I just start to cry. Thirty-five years later, it still hurts. But I know I'm going to see him again. But I've learned to say, And learn that the why question is going to lead you down to depression. Don't do it. You don't need to know why. You linger on that question. You're going to get angry at God and feel he's disappointed to you like I did the first time when our home was hit by lightning. It struck just feet away from my wife. I've learned, you know, soon learned that start praising Hey, the house is still here. My wife is still alive. And uh, I don't need to know why. Put the security gate up. Bring every thought to submission. Rebuke. Sometimes I'll, I'll have thoughts that I know are just plain wrong. I'll go to the bedroom, especially if my wife's out shopping or something. I'll go to the bedroom and I'll just speak out loud. I rebuke you, Satan. Get out of my mind. Get out of my life. Get out of my house. You have no business here. In Yeshua's mighty name, get out. And then I go read the Bible. Get on positive thoughts. Point number four. Get the right perspective on life. It's not about this life anyway. Look instead to eternity. You know, I might make, just make this a two-part message. I don't know. Get, get, quit thinking about this life. Learn the lesson of Hebrews 11. Those folks were willing to go through everything they did because they saw a city whose builder and maker was God. They looked to the end result, the greater reward that comes out ahead. Okay, so we know that. But you also say, but you said God still allows pain and suffering, catastrophes, anguish, and death. So now what? Those are great questions, but we do have to face this point. Get the right perspective. No matter what happens to us in this life, life isn't about this life except to learn the lessons and to be toughened up and to learn to have faith in Him and to love Him with all our heart. No matter what. The same lesson Abraham. Now I know that you will trust me, that you'll obey me, that you, are, that you love me. He said to Abraham, when he was ready to sacrifice his own son, Abraham, on the other hand, knew the God he served was a faithful God and had promised that all the, that even the Messiah would come through the line of Isaac. So if I have to sacrifice Isaac, because my God will never lie, in the, in the Bible it tells us that he saw Isaac resurrected, as it were, in a figure. He, his mind's eye, even if I have to kill him, he will be resurrected. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to trust my God. That's where we all have to come to. In Romans 8, 18, I consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. That's what I'm saying here. No matter what he does, the if-nots, no matter what he does allow you to go through, that's not worthy to even put up there against the glory that shall be revealed in us. Look ahead. Yes, you might die in pain from pancreatic cancer. 
Yes, your child might die, but the child only sleeps and will see him or her again, as I know from first-hand experience. We should not become disappointed with God. Hear my sermon when God disappoints. But humanly, it's so natural to feel like, hey, God, where were you? Where were you? You could have stopped that car accident. You could have prevented it. Hey, guys, it's all part of a test. Don't fail your test. Romans eight thirty-seven to 39, and all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded neither death nor life nor angels nor anything will separate us from the love of God. The end of Hebrews 10 verses 32 to 36 says that remember the early days. Hebrews 10 32 to 36. You endured a hard struggle with your sufferings. You are exposed to taunts, afflictions. And uh, you, you were jailed. And, uh, and, and verse 35. So don't throw away your confidence which has a great reward, for you need endurance, that after you have done God's will, after you may receive what was promised. It talks about in Hebrews 10, verse 34, you sympathize with the prisoners, accepted with joy. Hebrews 10, 34, the confiscation of your possessions, knowing that you yourselves have a better and enduring possession. You see the thrust of the Bible? Quit trying to make this life be the life. Forget about being Laodicean, folks, rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. Better to be like the Smyrna folks or the others who, I mean, they all went through hard hardships. You think we're going to be spared that? Look ahead. And what did Yeshua do? What did Yeshua do when he was faced with incredibly painful suffering? What did he do? Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So it's not about this life. Point number five. Point number five. A great way to change thinking, thinking is to praise and give thanks even before we see the answer. Praise Him in the trouble. Praise Him in the problem. Philippians 4, verse 6 and 9, 6 to 9. Don't be anxious for anything. For in everything, but, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Philippians 4, 6 to 9. With thanksgiving. I thank you for this problem, God in heaven. I thank you for it, my dear Abba you're working something out. Let your request be made known to God. Thy will be done, but I sure hope that it's kind of similar to my will. <laughs> it's kind of what we think. <laughs> and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true and noble, whatsoever things are just and pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are good, report. If there's any virtue, anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. I have a dear, dear friend who is struggling with his thinking, thinking. And he has said he's going to write down Philippians 4, 8 every single day for a week. Whatsoever things are pure, lovely, good, report, virtue, okay, noble, and all that. Think on these things. I have a sermon in my in the website called Praising God Before We See the Answer. Um, you really need to do that. And one of the best things to change fearful thoughts is to start praising and thanking Him already. Start praising and thanking Him already. And uh, you know what? If the door you've been praying for doesn't open for you, then it's not your door. It's not your door. It's not the door God intends for you. He may choose to test you further or whatever. But what do we do? We stew on the why question and we wonder why the door is not opening. Brethren, look ahead and praise Him, praise Him, praise Him. Okay? Number six, don't do it alone. You don't have to do it alone. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9 to 12 says, Two are better than one. If one falls, the others are able to help him up, and, and two will keep each other warm. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. I have to rush for time here. And we're never really alone. He sees us. He's in us. Our great God is part of us. We're part of Him. And He loves you so dearly. 
Reach out, though, to others as well. Friends, family, ask them to pray with you, cry with you. And remember, behold, I am my, be I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. That's in the book of Ecclesiastes, I think, chapter 6. Finally, number 7, take some, take some action. Take some action. You know what, you know what God did to uh, uh, face your fears in God, with God? There are, times to, there are times to wait and stop. Moses said to Israel, wait for the salvation. Stop, wait for the salvation. Exodus 14, 13 to 16. Wait upon the Lord. But then God says, why are you sitting there doing nothing? Hey, Start, start putting your hand across the Red Sea. We're going to split it in two, and you guys are going to walk across. Gideon was terribly afraid. He had 30, what was it, um, 32,000 or something like that people in Judges 7. Just read that story. And God says to Gideon, if you're afraid, go down and listen to what they're saying. If you're afraid, that's Judges 7, uh, verse 9 and 10. If you're afraid, go down. You take your servant with you. And they went down. That means he was afraid. Because God is saying, I'm ready to do this, Josh, uh, Gideon. I'm ready to do it. And when Gideon had come and, and they heard the story, so, so once Gideon got that confirmation, then he went to battle with that famous battle. I have so many, much what I want to say, a lot of time. But you guys, I hope this will help. Focus on him. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Whatever things are good, control the thoughts that come in your head. Understand the kind of father we have. Give up regrets. Don't be living. Uh, don't be. If, if your if your life is like a is like a book, don't be living in the last chapter. God wants a new chapter for you. You can't read the next chapter if you keep reading and being part of the old chapter. Take courage. God is with you. He'll finish what He started in you. Father in heaven, give us this faith that we talk about here. Give us this strength and this love from you. We thank you so much, and we just know that we don't have to fear, and that you will put us through fearful times at times, but you're with us. Thank you so much in Yeshua's mighty, powerful name. We love you both. We love you, Yeshua. We love you, Father. We love the Holy Spirit that you've given us, and that by which you live in us, and we live in you. Thank you so, so much in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen.